Yeah, okay. So I'll just sort of launch right into it. Uh, hi, good morning, Huva, uh, Huma uh all that. So my name's uh, Elliot Baker, and I'll introduce myself a little more in detail in a moment. Um, as you can, I'm sorry, I'm not going to be able to do this and finish for you, so you'll have to bear with me with that. Uh, but anyhow, so I came here to talk about uh, what I'm calling the triple point, which is the intersection of science and technology and business. Because we're at sort of a, a strange and exciting new time in the world with this uh, whole personal health technology momentum and trend that's happening, where all these people who have in the past been somewhat at odds with each other are starting to have to work together for various reasons. Uh, and I happen to work for Bedit. I just started there in December. Uh, Bedit's a sleep monitoring company. Are any of you familiar with Bedit? Some of you are. Okay. So this is who we are here. Uh, won't get too much into it, but basically bet it we put a uh, non-intrusive sleep monitor sensor on the mattress and using this uh, technology called ballisto cardiography, it interprets all these different autonomic nervous system uh, information from your heart rate, your respiration, your movement, so on and so forth. From that you get a pretty good idea of your sleep. Now what's interesting about this I'll start this whole talk with a, uh, my own personal history and how I got here because there's a, a reason why I'll be doing that. So uh, I'm doing science and tech communications at Bedit and in my past life I was a science journalist, I still do it sometimes, and a uh, research assistant at Harvard Medical School in a, uh, in a research, uh, in a sleep lab. I used to do some sleep research there. And I'm also a novelist. And so the reason these things are kind of funny that they come together is that as a sleep researcher, I was there for about 2004 to 2007, 8, around that time. And when I was doing sleep research, all you had to do was this thing called PSG, uh, polysomnography. It's a miserable experience. I mean, basically what we would do is you would put 14 to 22 sensors on someone's head, body, arms, legs. Uh, and then you would uh, put them into a bed and you'd monitor them, you would have to look at them all night time. And that was the only way you could get a good idea of what people were doing when they were sleeping. And we also had a very, uh, part of it too was we had a six foot four German lady who would tell these people, and now to get the cold temperature you must insert the rectal probe. And so that was an extremely invasive uh, process and procedure. It wasn't that fun to do for these people. It also influenced the sleep. It's also very expensive. It's a thousand bucks a night to do a PSG study inside of a U United States um, sleep lab. In Finland, I think it's somewhere more like 300 to 500 a night, maybe a little less than that, but it's roughly that. It's, it's still very expensive. And it's one night, so it's not a very long-term thing you're going to get. And it influences the sleep itself. If you put all this crap all over someone's head, all over their body, they're not going to be able to actually sleep the way they would normally sleep. If you have stuff on their chest, like an ECG, that's going to be taking away from their ability to sleep on their, on their side or on their stomach. So right away, if they have, uh, are you familiar with what sleep apnea is? It's obstruction of the airway, so you snore when you're on your back especially. So if you have positional apnea, this is going to force you to be in the position to actually uh, increase your apnea. So by, by measuring these people's sleep, you're actually influencing it. So I started getting into this thing. I came here and I had never heard of um, this. I'd never heard of ballistocardiography. I'd never heard of um, how possible it was to actually measure people's sleep other than with sleep trackers uh, on the wrist which uh, are notoriously um, not very accurate. Uh, they're, they do what they do well. I mean, it's fine. If, if your sleep can be measured exclusively by how much you move your arm, you might get some valuable information out of that. But if you happen to be someone who uh, moves, if you have restless legs, then your wrist tracker is not going to pick that up. Pick that up. It's going to think that you're asleep or that you're sleeping well, even though your legs are moving quite a bit because your arm doesn't happen to be moving. So there's a lot of different, uh, and also it only picks up your movement. It doesn't pick up your heart rate and your respiration. So the activity tracking, actigraphy from like Fitbit and Jawbone and those things, they they have their place for sure, but um, they have also just fundamentally uh, fundamental flaws inside of them for measuring sleep. So. The sleep tracking thing is how I got into it, uh, and since I've been here, and when I was covering uh, as a science journalist, I was also, I was mostly focused on health. I wrote for the uh, Harvard Health Letter, I wrote for a small paper called the uh, Nantucket Enquirer and Mirror, and I also wrote a little bit for the Wall Street Journal here and there, and I, I wrote a lot about health and health technology, and um, I, this was sort of, and I s 
basically got out of it full time in 2009, 2010. And this world didn't really exist, not to this extent. This qualified, this uh, quantified self thing wasn't a thing yet at all, at least not when I was covering it. Uh, so when I got back into it here, I felt like a very old man when all of a sudden I'm like, oh my God, these kids, what are these kids doing here? This quantified self and all these different fit bones and jaw bones and trackers. There was so much uh, information that people are now getting about themselves and there's so much information that's out there now that is available for other people, whether it's doctors, scientists, insurance companies, to use that's creating this infrastructure for a very interesting future. There's a lot of things that can be done with this. Because of that, there's going to be extremely big changes are going to be coming in the diagnosis of illness, uh, whether that's a sleep disorder, whether that's a lot of other things that can be uh, beyond sleep. The treatment of disorders, the follow-up, prevention, and personal health. From there, it's going to be a big changes in the way that we approach public health. If you're able to track lots of people for a very cheap price long term, you're going to have an unprecedented amount of information on how people's health is. The insurance companies are going to take notice of this. Um, this is something that's already sort of happening. You're already seeing some very small things coming through where insurance companies are giving out um, activity trackers to people and seeing if they can actually maintain good, uh, good health, good healthy habits, and then get reimbursed, get some kind of a, a benefit for doing that. Uh, big changes are coming to privacy. There's going to be something that's going to be a lot of... Um, issues with uh, privacy and I guess I would even ask you guys those of you who here are concerned about privacy issues okay yeah I think we all are I mean for good reason too uh, we've been taught time and again that we're being monitored we're being watched uh, as a novelist I think that's a great fodder for like a really scary science fiction story too I mean, the idea that someone could, um, I think who was, I think Dick Cheney at one point also, he had a pacemaker uh, and he had it taken out because he thought the Chinese were going to hack his pacemaker and make it explode. So there's a lot of different things that people are very nervous about with um, the different uses of technology and the uh, lack of privacy there. And another big chase is coming in uh, medical device regulations too. Now a lot of this that I'm going to be talking about is going to involve uh, the United States uh, regulations and the U.S. different um, things that are happening with uh, the healthcare system there. But of course it ripples into Finland uh, There's and Europe as well. So the first thing, with these changes that are coming, with all this data that we're developing, with all this data that we're giving up to people, uh, with all the data that we're giving up to private businesses, uh, can we stop the change? And um, I don't think so. I think that this is something that's going to be there. Like it's something that's going to have to, uh, we're going to have to somehow deal with it and go with it. So the genie's out of the bottle, the train has left the station, the toothpaste is out of the tube. It's something that we are just going to have to somehow make the best of it because there are these factors that are going to drive this change. Economics. I mean, the rising cost of, uh, of medicine, it keeps on going up. It keep, the cost to treat people keeps on getting higher and higher. And the population keeps on getting higher and higher. So you're going to need to find cheaper diagnosis and treatment and preventative medicine techniques that are out there. And that's what a lot of this personal health technology offers. It's a much cheaper option. So for instance, like with Bedit, if you're trying to... Um, measure your sleep. It's a one-time cost of, let's say, 149 euros retail. And you get this thing, and you can keep it in your mattress for as long as you want. You compare, and in theory, you could use it over and over again for multiple different, uh, for multiple patients, multiple different users. Now, you compare that with one person, one night, $1,000. The, the math obviously opens up eyes, whether it's in the insurance company or whether it's in the uh, different uh, medical facilities who are not able to be reimbursed by insurance or what have you. Also, the ease of use. Um, I won't get too much into the, I think that we had some good sleep statistics and some sleep understanding of like why sleep is important. But again, from the ease of use is something that is probably important to all of you as design-oriented individuals because in the past, medical devices are clunky, they're uncomfortable, 
I mean, they involve rectal probes. There's no way that that's like a good thing for people. They involve things that nobody wants to use, that makes you feel uncomfortable and violated. And so when people are designing things for the consumer audience, from a consumer perspective, you're designing things that are beautiful and that people don't mind using. In sleep, at least the perspective of Bennett that I happen to agree with is that you are actually designing something that doesn't interfere with your sleep, that is invisible to your sleep, that you don't even notice. It's different where if you're wearing like an, uh, an Apple Health Watch or any kind of a, a wearable or, or a ring for that matter, you want it to look good. It has to have a certain form function. With sleep, I think for most people, they would prefer not to even know that it's there. And uh, that's something that by designing that with the consumer in mind, there is developed the right technology for the right people. And also the quantified self-movement, this is something that's not... Does anybody here consider themselves quantified self-people? Come on, admit it. I know you're out there. Uh, uh, okay. Um, well, this movement's attracted some really fascinating people, I've found. I mean, there's some people... Uh, People who are in charge of extremely important labs all around the world are quantified selfers, and they've done some pretty cool things. Uh, these people are also, and so they're also leading the change themselves, and they're also from the grassroots. These are people whose passion and enthusiasm for tracking their own data is creating these communities and these movements that are expanding as people realize more and more that the more data they have on themselves, uh, the more they can actually understand and uh, potentially solve a problem that they might be having in health. Uh, so some of the indicators of the change, I mean, you have the Oscar Insurance is giving out Misfits flashes. Oscar Insurance is a smaller insurance company, but these are people who are really getting to the head of the game with um, using these different personal technology in ways to uh, give out, uh, to encourage healthy behavior. So this is a, th I mean, Everyone here is probably aware of the insurance system in the U.S. It's, a, again, a fundamentally flawed and broken system. But uh, it is what it is. And in Finland, I think there's a, a different s approach towards health because it's not a business, a matter of business. In the United States, health is huge business. It's um, something that these people... And the question is, is like, what do these people want, the insurance companies want, out of the perfect uh, consumer? Uh, you know, th through my own kind of optimistic guys, I think that good health tends to be good business. If you have really bad health, like the obesity epidemic that was referenced earlier in America, that's a hugely expensive thing. It w covering fat people is really, really hard. I mean, fat people are really hard to, like, deal with because they're, they're having so many different problems with, ob with uh, diabetes, with long-term heart problems. It's really expensive. And that's why insurance companies are trying to promote at least somewhat a more healthy population. But on the other hand, uh, I, I told this to uh, the head of the National Sleep Foundation a couple weeks ago, and he laughed at me. He said, God, you're naive. No, the, the perfect consumer for a U.S. insurance company is someone who dies suddenly after paying in for many, many years. Idea being you pay, you pay, you pay, and then you never actually have to have an illness covered. So I think the truth is somewhere between those two things, but anyhow. Uh, and the same things happen with different large organizations. They're giving out personal wearable health things to their uh, employees. Uh, IBM, Accenture, Insurance, Bates College. We've been approached at Bedit by very large, very large companies about doing the same thing for uh, consumer health benefit programs. Uh, and then going from there, so the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, um, have historically been at odds with any kind of innovation in uh, whether it's drugs or medical uh, medical devices. I, I don't know if any of you have ever worked somewhere where you've had to deal with that before, but uh, it's a hugely expensive process to go through the FDA, and it's terrifying because if you don't do it right, then all of a sudden you're on the radar and they can come after you. So for that reason, Bedded is a consumer device, meaning it doesn't offer any kind of treatment or diagnosis. But uh, that being said, other people are using us for this kind of tracking thing without, you know, just because it, it's useful in that way. So, and it's not just us. It's being the same thing with Jawbone, Fitbit, the same thing with uh, Misfit, with uh, all the other ones that are out there, ResMed, uh, S+. Plus. And the FDA has been taking notice of this, and people have been really afraid about what they were going to do. Are they going to bring the hammer down on people? Is this going to be the time when this whole the party just stops? Like, they're like the fun police. They come and say, nope, that's it. All these devices are, are not... No, they're not like 
extremely accurate to the degree of a medical device? And the answer is no. Um, the strangest thing is that the FDA seems to see a benefit to all this data. They seem to see a benefit to public health. This guy, Baku Patel, uh, he's the one who's in charge of the uh, consumer focused health gadgets, is saying, uh, I think he told this to Bloomberg Business in January of this year, we are taking a very light touch and almost hands off approach if you have tech that motivates people to stay healthy. Well, that sounds like a good thing. Let's hope that, you know, let's hope. One thing that the FDA does have, and uh, I, I have mixed feelings about it, but it's the 510K, in which if you have a new, uh, if you have a technology that is basically the same as an old technology, you'll get uh, approval much quicker if it's class one, if it's, if it's not, if you're not cutting someone open, if you're not um, offering radiation and stuff. If someone's already made something um, that everyone knows is not going to hurt you like an, acti uh, an activity tracker and it happens to provide a medical benefit for diagnosis, then you can get it pushed through the FDA quickly. The problem is that if, if you're only doing the same damn thing over and over and over again, you're not going to really innovate anything. You're just going to keep on making the same toaster with another like thing for like bread for the for more bread from the toaster. You're not going to develop like an incredible new technology to, to make toast faster and more interesting. So, in a way, so like with you know with ballistic cardiography, there are some like there are some technologies that are out there for. Uh, more specific medical uses that that it could sort of get slid into, but it's it's scary because if you get on their radar and you don't get approved right away in the in the streamlined 510k process, then you're kind of on the naughty list, and then you don't know what they're going to do to you. Like if you you know then they think that then they're going to kind of know that you're in the system, and if anyone whispers they might be using you for a treatment or diagnosis, then it's like you know that then it's not good. You don't want them coming after you. So. That's why it is encouraging that there seems to be, uh, FDA has, has publicly come out and said, we want to work with Silicon Valley, we want to work with technology, because they see a huge benefit to people becoming, uh, whether this technology motivates people to become more healthy, which it apparently it does. There's, there is some evidence in the scientific literature that by tracking your, uh, your activity uh, and sleep supposedly that you will actually improve it uh, but besides that there's also a lot of uh, potential with knowing what's going on with having some kind of a basic fingerprint some kind of a signature of your entire health put into numbers on an excel sheet Obama wears a Fitbit uh, and the yeah so there's 68.1 million wearable tech devices that will probably be shipped this year and uh, wearable tech as an industry is expected to reach 50 billion so it's a Big, big money, big, big uh, public health benefit, personal health benefit. So it's coming. And again, going back to the design. So this is a this is a very non-invasive PSG setup. I saw this over in Korea at the World Association of Sleep Medicine conference about a month ago. And so this is a these are. And it is. It's a better than like typically. What, what I used to have to do is take this kind of like uh, scalp paste, and I'd have to tape all the different things on the people's heads, and then you'd have to put all the you know all that stuff, and then you'd have to have this uh, wrap these, uh, and then tape the same thing with the ECG. You'd have to tape those just right to get the right vectors of the electrical current and whatnot. And there is better medical devices out there, but it still looks like that. It's still not great. Uh, not very comfortable. And even the super non-invasive goes down to this. And then this is where it's kind of heading to, is this kind of technology. Very simple, very clean, very non-invasive. And uh, this will never, and, and don't get me wrong, this will never be as accurate as this. It's not possible. You can't know, you'll never be able to know precisely what N1, N2, N3, N4, REM sleep stage you're in without having an EEG around your head. It's not possible to do that. But you can get a really good representation of that based upon your respiration, your heart rate, your, your activity. You can get something close, but you'll never be perfectly accurate. And the question was, when we went to this conference, was... Um, how good is how good is good enough? At what point is like accurate enough helpful to people and helpful to the science community? So this is just illustrating that fact. Um, no, so the accuracy of the medical devices is always it will always be above. Uh, it, there is one statistic I want to I want to bring up, and this is something that I, I've talked to people about too when I go to these conferences now. Is that um, 
I think in the United States, the CDC caused a huge ripple last year, a huge, uh, a huge wave when they, they said they announced uh, sleep deprivation and sleep was a public health epidemic. And there was like the silent epidemic. And is the statistic was 20 to 25 percent of all Americans and 300, peop- 300 million people in the country have a sleep disorder of some kind, uh, whether it's insomnia or uh, apnea, periodic limb movement. Of those, the idea is that maybe a fraction, just a sliver of that, are actually diagnosed. And that is because it's a failure of medical devices to be able to be used enough to actually at least indicate whether people have some kind of a disorder. So, is big data, is, is any Star Trek fans here? Star Trek New Generation, am I showing my age? Data of the Cyborg, well, this is Data of the Cyborg, so I know his name is Data. So the big question that people are going to is, is big data evil? And um, I don't know, what do you guys think? Again, there's concerns about privacy, but is there, there's no, I don't know. There's not like a right or wrong, a right or wrong answer to it necessarily, but yeah, I, I think, and, and the, the point behind that is that, uh, yeah, of course it's not by itself evil. Is nuclear energy evil by itself? Probably not, but I mean, you can use it for evil, for sure. I mean, our, our car is evil. Anytime that you have something that is a new technology or a new uh, way of doing something, then it, there, there's going to be a lot of fear about it. And, uh, for, you know, I'm, I'm the same way. I mean, for sure, I, I'm very nervous about the... I remember when Facebook first came online, I happened to be at Harvard at the time, and so I was one of the first people to get a, a Facebook um, uh, account. And uh, at first we were all like, yay, we're Facebooking, sharing everything. Like things that I thank God that no one can see those old pictures from when I was a student. And uh, then slowly as the you know the technology started to develop it uh started to become apparent that oh my god like they're 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 tracking everything about us like they're having all this information on us and then there was the paranoia like being tracked and like what this all is going to mean i mean this is this is an extension of the social media uh sharing of your own personal preferences and data and whatnot and this is just going inside you know like literally going inside of yourself and sharing that kind of data and what that's going to mean uh but in order for this so Again, so the genie's out of the lamp, the toothpaste out of the tube. What to do with it? Uh, it's going to be about the way that we use it, and that's going. Yeah, please. Sorry, one of my concerns is that when you're using data, people often use the data in the wrong way. So you don't look at big pictures, for example, and you take instances and you start altering your behavior on some sort of premises that are completely wrong, and people, I don't know, freak out or they don't see like the whole picture or, or maybe they don't think about their life like in all their actions, what they're taking. Instead, they're just monitoring like certain things. And I think that's like, that can have catastrophic like consequences in one person's health or in a, if a company is data mining and they would only look for certain instances that could lead them completely off like track. And, and do like severe financial damage. And I see that kind of like happening sometimes with the personal health stuff. So what's your take on that and how are you combating that? That's interesting. I mean, what, what, I, what I thought you were going to go to is when people look at their data and they see one thing they pick up on and they freak out about it. But you're actually talking about if a company, like an insurance company, were to look at someone's data, see maybe whatever that would be, I don't know, and then act on it? There's always the sort of perception, how you look at it, and what points you're seeking for, and and how are you like interpreting the data, and mm-hmm. how are how are you like enabling the right interpretation for the people who are using your your data systems? Or yeah, that, that's a hugely. If if you can figure out the answer to that question, we'll give you a million bucks. I guarantee you. I mean, the the question of big data, you see at every single conference is like, how do we we have all this data? What do we do with it? How do we develop solutions from this data? that is not going to be harmful. And that, that is a huge question because it's going to involve integrating all these different devices, uh, you know, from oximetry and galvanic skin response to sleep to uh, activity and everything else and seeing what it all means together and how they're... Because the fact is, no one can really know because we have very good guesses based on science, but with this data set, this is an unprecedented, a huge amount of information to look at and to see how it all comes together and what it actually means. But that being said, sure, I mean, if they look at the wrong thing, um, I'm not sure like what a good example of that is, but I, I have some 
examples of, of looking at the right things would be if someone uh, obviously has a sleep apnea, that increases their chance of a heart attack or a stroke by 50%. And in that case, those persons, those people probably should be, um, be getting checked up on based upon their age. They should have some kind of a checkup to make sure their heart's okay. On the bad side of that, gosh, I don't... So what I, where I thought you were going to go, here's an example of that, is uh, one, one Finnish researcher who's a friend of mine here I've, I've worked with and gave her a bet it, and she didn't like it at all because it freaked her out because she has chronic pain. And so she saw her, her sleep data was really full of movement. And she probably, and there's a, there's a big, uh, I think sleep deprivation has a 700% increase in chronic pain later life or something. There, there is this a shocking amount of a correlation there. And so for her, it kind of created this real stress when she was looking at her data from that. But she, um, and, and we're kind of trying to talk her off the ledge from that, like not to freak out so much. That's, that's where I thought you were going to go. And sure, other people, uh, historically where that first became a big deal was when the internet uh, the interweb when, when, when the internet first became a thing and people started like googling their symptoms and going to the doctor and they thought headache oh my god spinal meningitis I'm gonna die tomorrow and so people would freak themselves out with by having an incomplete set of information they would just have symptoms and put that in there and freak out about it the same thing can certainly happen from an incomplete uh, set or understanding of the information here now if a company I'm not sure what a company would do like how I'm definitely, I mean, does anyone have an idea, like, of, like, I mean, because like, a scenario in which, like, if they viewed an incomplete or a very granular piece of data, and they came up with a wrong and unhelpful um, response to that, I'm not sure, what, I'm not, I'm sure there are many, many cases of that, but I'm not sure what that would be exactly. Come on, it's, it's like, think about it. What kind of data is collected all the time from us without any gadgets? We use the the uh, customer cards for, for shopping. Mm -hmm. We use the electrical um, bus tickets all the time. We carry these things around all the time. We actually, they say that, that, that with access of the current day that we are at the moment delivering all the time, we are pretty much profiled all the time. And, and using, with these, these things uh, with us, we actually, we can be located we can be kind of identified. Our behavior can be tracked. Our relatives. Uh, this this thing is going on at the moment, and I I doubt that having <coughs> a ring or having a a stretch in your bed doesn't change a thing. It's it's just more evident. But the basic thing is that if somebody wants to know who we are at the moment, where we are, what we do, with who, it's already possible right now, right here. That's that's quite obvious, but if somebody is telling you to alter your behavior or something based on the data that they're taking from you, then it's different than giving passive data to a company. But thinking about the, thinking about the evil, evil uh, brains watching you. I, mean. I don't <coughs> know if there's good or evil. I'm more concern. concerned in proper or not. Here, here's an example of that that might. So with genetic test, this is sort of different than this, but I, well, no, no, I mean, genetic testing is becoming more and more accessible now. I've seen it at the different um, at booths now. It's almost like it, it probably will become like an app at some point to get your own genome mapped. It, yeah, yeah, or, or yeah, or how, and so from, and from, from that, then you could potentially do damage to someone. If you had, if you told someone you had a certain percentage chance of uh, genetic disease, like Huntington's disease or something, and it wound up being such that the, and they were wrong. Um, that could that could cause dramatic effect. I, I think that's for what you're talking about. If you had, am I on the right track with that? Uh, yeah. So Isn't this already happening with advertising? I mean, all the bonus cards we're using and the ads that we're seeing on the web because we're using those bonus cards and all the other information. Oh sure, the market. Yeah, and I'm we're already buying stuff even if we don't necessarily you want. Visit, them you visit you visit Copenhagen, and next time you you get. Advertisements in day. How many of us will see after the having? Oh, sure, yeah. 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 Uh, <coughs> kids could breakfast, we'll see Bennett advertisements on our <laughs> web searches or. All of you. Exactly. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> No, oh sure, that that's absolutely, oh yeah, I mean the marketing thing, that's, yeah, that, that left the station a long time ago, yeah. These are sort of different things though, I think, because what I'm interpreting what she's saying is, is that using your, your data pro, your, uh, like your 
browsing history and your profiles there for marketing purposes is one thing, but taking your health data and acting upon that with a specific targeted uh, prescription. Well, somebody who, who will have that information will either use it in a good way or in, or in a bad way. I mean, either they propose you, you should get some sleep help, or then they'll try to sell you an extra something. <laughs> Doesn't really help. Yeah, yeah, it's a best thing. Yeah, it is. It's true. I mean, it could be if you're if all your stuff goes to how many of time if all your stuff goes into a, a place where anybody can access it at any time. Sure, there's there's a lot of that'd be a bummer. Like if bed it turned evil and all of a sudden we we saw your sleep and said you're gonna die in ten days unless you take this specific medication paid for by Pfizer. Yeah, that's something that you don't want to have happen in the world like that. I wouldn't really want to work for that company. But like, yeah. What happened was, getting back into like the uh, the reception of this whole uh, consumer personal health technology by the science community. Again, so when I was as a researcher and when I was working uh, in the research world and in the journalism world, especially, very very suspicious of the business world. You're you're taught to be so. You're it's basically at least. I assume it's the same. Maybe is it different in Finland? Because in the states, at least, th they're supposed to be opposed. There's business. And then there is uh, journalism and science, and, and you never trust each other. And you have to be very suspicious at all times. You can never have, there's like an ethical compromise if you're ever found to have too good of a friendship with a business. I'm not sure if it's different in Finland or not. It seems to be changing, of course, but it's changing everywhere. But in the past, that's how it's been. And so um, we decided to start going to sleep conferences this year. I was, I was pushing for it because I started um, giving our, our device to some old colleagues of mine and uh, they were really excited about it. They said, whoa, this is pretty cool. It's how much does it cost? Well, the data is not perfect, but it's really, really good. This, okay. And so from there we started and then and we started um, thinking about it and we started uh, looking at our data and we started making these scientific papers in which we could actually predict stuff like apnea and uh, periodic lip movement from our data. Uh, with pretty strong accuracy too, strong enough that we're um, going to be able to publish it. And so we went to the um, different shows, and we, whenever we go to CES in Vegas or the Wearable Tech Show in London, you know, we get lots of nice, happy, "Hey, how you doing?" Everyone's, it's, you know, get, everyone gets along well at those kind of shows. But and we weren't sure how it would be when we went to the World Association of Sleep Medicine conference. We were prepared to just get beaten up when we went there by the scientists, especially by the medical device manufacturers, because they're they're not so happy about this movement because they're they're the ones who, they're the ones who are probably standing to lose from this to some degree. Not entirely, but to some degree. And uh, so we went there and we had a little booth. It was me and some of you guys might know uh, my colleague Auntie Ulimutka. And um, people were really nice to us. Like everyone was like it was shocking. I mean, once we would start talking to people, and what we we did this crazy thing was we were honest to them, saying, "Yeah, we're not as gonna, we're not PSG. We're not going to be able to give you perfect data, but is it good enough? Is it something that where by by monitoring lots and lots and lots of people's sleep over time and getting lots of information, is that useful to you?" And uh, the National Fle uh, Sleep Foundation, uh, oh God, Max, uh, whatever his last name is, um, he he spent time at our booth every day for oftentimes an hour at a time talking about the future of uh, wearable tech and where this is going to go and what this is going to do. It's like, yeah, you guys are the future. This is the future of uh, sleep medicine. This is the future of sleep research is being able to get huge data, uh, data sets over a long term with high compliance. I uh, spoke with a guy named Matt Bianchi from Harvard Medical School. He's in charge of the sleep division there. And um, he's a really cool guy, like two earrings, kind of a punk rock looking dude. And uh, he was just saying, listen, I... I will accept inferior accuracy in tech for perfect compliance. I will accept that because our data has failed, our technology has failed to get good sleep measurement over long periods of time over uh, broad populations. Uh, and just his idea was that there's too many in the science community are stuck in outdated thinking using conceptually flawed technology. And oftentimes people come up to us and say, hey man, everybody's talking about you guys. We were the only consumer uh, device there at this place. And so we were sort of these weird kind of, we sort of stuck out a little bit with our, you know, our, our little piece of tape that you put on the bed. And then it, it was it was different. And so, uh, but different would happen to be a good thing there. Yeah, the same, and getting back into these different things. I've mentioned it earlier, but by focusing on the consumer rather than on the technology itself and on the accuracy, what the science community finally saw is that people are developing, uh, things are being developed that they can actually use and actually get meaningful data from. 
and that people will want to use. And uh, the design is a huge, huge factor in that. It goes beyond just the accuracy. And the obstacles that we're going to have to overcome is going to be basic attitudes, the certain resistances to change, certain resistances to uh, sticking with what you know, and the idea that you need to have the perfect accuracy to have anything that you can uh, that has anything of meaning. Uh, there's going to be people who are going to have to stick their, net out, their neck out a little bit, and the people who are sticking their neck out right now uh, from the science community are they tend to be pretty big big wig people uh, from pretty pretty good institutions, so that's that's encouraging also. And the next thing is that um, the other thing that could be a problem is if there comes to be a rush of like really crappy technology and they make dubious claims and that erodes trust. Because the thing that's happening right now is there's a lot of goodwill. That's the reason why the FDA is excited about this. That's the reason why these top institutions are excited is that there's been a lot of really good uh, stuff coming out from this world. And uh, the biggest uh, fear is that the uh, regulation security from uh, FDA are going to say, oh my god, kill it, kill it with fire. This is like this new thing. We have to immediately destroy it before it becomes big data and attacks us all. Where are you going to take this next? <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. Well, the, we're, um, we're working with uh, consumers still, of course, but what's happened is that now, because of this uh, this big reception from the science community, we're going to be working a lot more with uh, with doctors and with uh, the research community because for them they get it. The basic flaw of Bedit and of a lot of different wearable technologies in this world is that we don't offer solutions because uh, that's going to that's that's a diagnosis. And consumers want to. I want a solution. I would love to wake up in the morning and have my Bedit tell me like what to do. I want I want to know that, but we can't do that. And so that's going to be a limiting factor in in this world taking off, I think, is until we can develop a solution. And so in my own personal opinion is that by working with these uh, larger long-term uh, long studies and whatnot, they're going to develop the stu solutions for us and peer review them in papers, and then we can integrate that into our technology. So for us, it's going to be working with us, uh, because the researchers, they don't need to be told what to do. They're going to get their data. They know what they're looking for. They know what they want. If they, if they just want to get respiration data uh, for these different kinds of people for about a month, they'll know exactly what they want, how to use it. Uh, the same thing with if you're uh, looking for uh, sleep apnea and you're a doctor, you know what you're looking for. You will to find that in this thing. So the doctors will want it. Large organizations, they know what they want. They want to see if they want to... Uh, uh, they want to put in some kind of a health benefit program for their employees saying if all of you sleep at least seven hours a night for this month we want to see if productivity goes up you know and that's already happened with some organizations doing with activity tracking if all of you guys get 10,000 steps a month we'll see if your if your productivity goes up if you're happier if we have a better workplace so that's where it's going now oh and professional sports teams we're working with uh, the Miami Dolphins the Los Angeles Lakers the New York Yankees the Team Canada basketball they've come at us from the sports world uh, the sports world is never going to be a big money maker, uh, just because there's not enough of it necessarily. But it's it's great for marketing. I mean, it's pretty cool. I, I I'm a huge sports fan, so it's kind of neat to work with these folks and see that like by looking at your sleep data, you actually get an extremely extremely useful uh, sense of recovery and a peak performance time based on your uh, circadian phenotype and whatnot. I agree with you. It's also I think it's great to see what Finland's doing in like and uh, from the university perspective to develop these different companies from their scientific institute. I mean, like what what uh, Alto is doing with all the different uh, promotion of of this world wearable technology and trying to create these spin-off companies from their research uh, programs and from their students, I think is great. And the fact that it does have a scientific background. And yeah, and Loss is our CEO, Loss Lepikorpi, and we've had a, our science-based. Uh, we've had PSG validation studies with Marco Partinen, who's uh, Finland's biggest, probably top sleep uh, researcher, former president of the World Association of Sleep Medicine. So, um, yeah. So, yeah, for sure. It's, it's, a sci it's one of the big reasons I, I, I did want to work there and kind of get out into the private sector like this, is that it has a big uh, scientifically scientific grounding. Yeah. Thanks for having me.